It's a privilege and a pleasure to welcome Michael on the stage with me as long with Trevor. So for those that know me, I was a 400, 200 meter growing up, 200 meter runner growing up, and Michael was a huge inspiration to me, not only professionally in terms of athletics, but also really in terms of my career as where I've gone and really as a venture capitalist. So it's, it's awesome to kind of share the stage with you here. So really to sort of give a little bit of, you know, snapshot on Michael's career. The man has won four Olympic gold medals, eight world championships, formally held the 200 meter and 400 meter world records. 200 meters only to be broken by Hussein Bolt, some guy named Hussein. <laughs> and now is transferred over to a successful career post-athletics as an award-winning commentator for the BBC and runs a series of performance centers all across the, the world working with teams like Man U and Arsenal, you may have heard of those companies, those, those teams. And then Trevor, Trevor works very closely with Michael and Michael Johnson Performance as a mental conditioning coach. Outside of that, he also works very closely with Russell Wilson. You have a startup together and had a career with Alabama Crimson Tide and Nick working closely in really crafting that dynasty. And I think early on also with Serena and Venus, you had some time with them. So really the focus on today's session is to talk about how we can really leverage a lot of the knowledge that these two individuals here have in terms of the athlete mindset and how that could be leveraged in the boardroom and also with our portfolio company CEOs. So maybe sort of just jumping in a little bit, you never got a silver, a silver or a bronze medal, just only gold. How did that, how, how, how did that work? How did that happen? <laughs> I don't have anything against silver or bronze medals. I just don't have any of those. Um, <laughs> And it's, um, you know, it's one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career is the consistency. And um, I'm often asked about, you know, you know, whether I'm more proud of the records or the medals. And it is the consistency because it's extremely difficult to go into every major championship, every Olympic uh, game and, um, and, and win um, on the day. Uh, because it's, it's not, um, the Olympic Games is not the NFL, it's not football, it's, there's no championship every year, it's every four years, which essentially could mean that you only get one opportunity to do that in your entire career or your entire life. I was fortunate to be able to represent the U.S. in three different Olympic Games, uh, but, but you know each time I may not ever get this opportunity again. So that's difficult enough, and I, I participate in an event that takes 19 seconds. So. You're standing there, <laughs> if you're good at it, it's 19 seconds. Um, <laughs> but you're standing there, you know, behind the blocks uh, before the gun goes off, and, and at that moment you know that I'm either going to be the Olympic champion or I'm not. And, it, and I'm going to know in 19 seconds. And it all comes down now, it all comes down to whether or not I can execute this race the best way I know how and the way that I've trained to. And, and, and that's not easy to do. I know it, it looks simple, the gun goes off, not simple. <laughs> take off, everybody runs as fast as they can, keep turning left, and the first person to the finish line wins. That is exactly <laughs> what we do, yes. But what's happening as you're going through the race is you're going through different zones and you have a strategy you're trying to execute and you're making adjustments and you're paying attention to the other athletes. So all of that's very difficult and um, but I always wanted to be in that moment standing behind the blocks before that gun goes off and I'm, and I'm going through my mind thinking, yeah, in the next 19 seconds I'll know if I'm successful or not. I always wanted to be able to feel at that moment that I have done everything that I possibly could over the last weeks, months, and years to be ready for this moment to deliver the best performance that I possibly can. Um, and, and so that means that when you back up in all of those weeks and days before, that every day you're giving everything you can, taking every day as an opportunity to be better and to be ready for that moment. And how do you focus out the distractions? You have like 80,000 plus people potentially in a stadium. Before the gun goes off, it's just like deafening silence and then flashing lights and you know there's millions of people watching on television. There's seven other athletes 
on the field that for the last three and a half years have been preparing for this moment and are chasing after that gold medal where if you don't get it, that means you may not get your Nike contract, you may not get the Wheaties box, you're probably not able to feed your children, you're getting a pair of steak knives. So like, how, how did you really kind of just mentally prepare yourself and focus yourself and limit those uh, distractions? Yeah. So the easy answer is to not think about all of those things first. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it's that whole thing of, you know, if I tell you not to think about this, that's exactly what you're going to think about. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that is true. So, um, so distractions, you know, going down, coming down to actually focus, um, you know, how do you focus on the moment and how do you just, you know, get in that moment and focus only on what matters right now. And it's, you know, for me, it was, it was one of the things that I attribute um, a, a great deal of my success to, and that is, you know, understanding myself as a person and how do I get the best from myself in the moment? Yeah. How do I get into the right emotional state and, and the right mental state to be able to perform at this moment and deal with this pressure situation? And that was developed over many years and a lot of introspection mm -hmm. and a lot of self-analysis to understand, all right, you know, who am I and what do I thrive on? Yeah. What is my kryptonite, you know, yeah. and, and how do I deal with those things? And Fortunately, you know, I had a bit of an advantage because I just happened to be one of those weird people that I just love being in that really nervous pressure situation. That's where I thrive, <laughs> That's you know, and I can sit here today removed from my career and retired and people ask me often, you know, do you miss it? And weirdly enough, that 20 minutes or so before the race when you know, you're really nervous and you know that again that, you know, I'm going to know in these 19 seconds coming up whether or not I'm going to win or not. Really, I missed that. Mm. That was I wow. missed that. That wow. was that's that's my moment right wow. there. So yeah, that's what I missed. So so because I, I I enjoyed that and because I you know I thrived on it, but also just understanding yeah well how do I how do I put myself in the best position at that moment to be prepared to focus and go in and execute. Um, you know that that's how you do you, you deal with that sort of pressure. Now, Trevor, I want to shift to you as you know, the sport of track and field, you know, it feels very individual. And you've had the experience of being able to work directly with Crimson Tide and Nick and that team-based environment and how to yes. really motivate that crew and really just build an amazing college football dynasty, one of the best, you know, just college football teams ever. So can you talk a little bit about what did you do there and some of the <laughs> techniques you apply with the team? Well, let me kind of reference Michael first. Um, for many years, I worked at uh, the IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida, and IMG um, was originally founded by a, a, a very bright person who would fit in well with this room, certainly much more than I think I would, uh, Mark McCormick, and uh, the academy was about 600 acres uh, in Bradenton, Florida, and 1,000 high school athletes at about $75,000 a year, so it was kind of Hogwarts for athletes. And uh, our agent, sort of the super agent, Tom Condon, brought <coughs> Michael Johnson in in 2000, right after the Sydney Olympics, to um, just sort of spend some time with a group of 15 NFL draft prospects, three of them, which are Hall of Famers, Drew Brees, LaDainian Tomlinson, and Steve Hutchinson, and asked Mike to, to, to kind of come in and, and maybe just touch them and put some speed juice on them. <laughs> and, uh, you, but it doesn't maybe work, work on, by the way. On some, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, some technique and some starts. But what was fascinating for me, I was 25 and, and, and I had been raised in a unique in, environment. My father was one of the original contributors to the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and I'd been raised, he was the president of the National Association for Self-Esteem. So I'd had sort of unique education, but I was working in our sports psychology department. and. It, when, when as much as Michael spent time working with these guys on technique, we had him come in and just spend an hour talking about how are you number one in the world from 1989 to 2000. And what was fascinating for me was as you listen to him talk and articulate why it was clear that he was extremely consciously competent. He could articulate, understand exactly what it took to allow him to succeed. And everything was simple. 
So I, I remember, I think Drew Brees asked him, you know, like, like, what was your platform for setting goals? Well, a lot of people, for him, when he's at Purdue or taught, you know, goals need to be smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic time frame. And Mike was more like, well, well if you walk into Safeway, you, you have things written down or you struggle. So, I mean, and many of you in here don't do well in Safeway because you go in without something written down myself included. And so much was based on this unique simplicity. Keep my head down, pump my arms, explode, I'm a bullet. And you understand that there's these fundamentals of thinking. We can only sustain one thought at a time. We have this constant dialogue. There is no such thing as blocking things out. When my mind focuses on an individual uh, specific task, everything's blocked out. Mm -hmm. So Michael wasn't thinking of the 2.8 billion people or the 100,000 people in that stadium or the fact that he was wearing gold shoes and he'd look bizarre getting a bronze medal wearing gold <laughs> shoes, right? And, and he explained sort of the whole concept of the gold shoes and you saw that it was this unique psychological architecture that allowed him to maximize his talent. And when I think of the University of Alabama um, and, and, and that opportunity. When I started with Coach Saban, it was 2006. Sports psychology is a very small field. I, I know it's grown a little bit here for many of you who are your own version of Axe Capital and your own version of Wendy Rhodes. Um, and, and, but at, at Alabama, we believed that um, the psychological elements could be influenced. And while Ohio State might have nine, you know, 930 athletes, 37 programs, and one clinical psychologist, at our height, we had six different consultants at over a seven-figure a year spend for 80 players. Mm. And my job was making our really good players better. And I had to take information to all of our players that was uh, based on um, uh, real sort of simplicity, like Mike talked about, head down, pop my arms, explode, you're a bullet. So when I think of Nick Saban, he has a unique understanding, like Michael said, of himself, who he is, how he's motivated, what the overall uh, elements that drive human performance are. There are sort of seven critical factors, uh, uh, 21 factors off those seven, three sub factors, and then ultimately one word which we focus on, which is performance, not winning, but performing well. Because you can win and not, not do a lot of things right, and you can perform really well and lose. Yeah. So I think what's unique about Alabama is there's a, a very complicated understanding of um, how to execute the process, and there are developed programmatics that are based on simplicity. We don't talk about neuro-linguistic processing or all these things that, uh, that become complicated. Everything's built on the simplicity. It's built on language. It's built on uh, behaviors, and we don't believe that emotions drive success. We believe that behaviors drive success. And, and Alabama behaves well. And my last point would be college football, you, you lose about 33% of your workforce every year. Yep. So you're, you're constantly being forced to reevaluate and, and, and sort of rebuild your process. And, and we also know that the, the high percentage of turnover, look at the NFL, right? Almost 30% of the coaches were fired this year. So you have to have a system. Um, I, you know, we talk about mental health now. I think what's interesting is None of the psychological elements at Alabama were built uh, because it was the right thing they were due. They were built fundamentally to help coaches keep their job yeah. and to help people win. And part of that is addressing the psychological element proactively, making good better, and then having a plan for players who are struggling to achieve that aptitude. Well, I guess a question I have there, so if I were to take an analogy, one of my portfolio company CEOs where I feel like I want to actually work to get the best out of them by bringing in so a mental conditioning coach to help optimize performance. Similarly, when you were at sort of Alabama, Nick brought you in and you're being sort of tasked to help serve these players. How do you get opt-in? How do you actually get someone to actually engage and really want to actually invest in that part of their performance? Because I imagine, you know, you get these, these, these kids that are coming out of high school, think they're big time, and then you have Trevor come in, but let me actually tell you how to orient yourself in the mental mindset for maximizing performance. And like, how, how, do you, how do you actually psychologically get them to engage? And, and it's actually for, for both Well, that's, a, that's probably a better question because Michael had, had some exposure to, to that field as a, an Olympian. Yeah. And then he also had an exposure. I mean, Michael, for me, was instrumental in my career as well as my partner, Chad Bowling, who handles the New York Yankees and the Dallas Cowboys now. And, and, and 
I mean, I think you could answer that question probably the best. Buy-in is important, and I think it's all about how it's presented to you, but um, I had an experience. My first experience with a sports psychologist was in 1992 uh, during the Barcelona Olympics. So that was my first Olympic Games. Um, I'm defending world champion, um, all world, all everything. I hadn't lost in two years, and so I go into that Olympics as the heavy favorite to win. Got food poisoning just before and um, wrecked my pr preparation, my final preparation, and so I wasn't able to perform at the level that I was expected to and didn't win. I didn't get to the finals. So, um, so imagine, as I said before, you know, you don't know if you're ever going to get this opportunity again. And that is the nature of being a, an Olympic athlete. You know, you've got to perform on the day, you've got to be ready. Um, so uh, team coaches suggested that I see the team, every team we have a sports psychologist for every Olympics there's a team of sports psychologists, so they suggested I see one. And I was obviously very disappointed. Um, uh, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity and, and for no fault of my own, you know, uh, it didn't work out. And so um, they suggested I see the, the psychologist. And um, I didn't feel like I needed to see a sports psychologist. But my dad, <laughs> you know, sort of said, yeah, why don't you just try it? You know, because he knew I was very upset. And I walked in there and within two minutes I thought, if I stay here, I'm going to be worse. If I stay <laughs> here, I will really do something crazy because this is not, I mean, my relationship with my mother growing up has nothing to do with what is going on right now, you know? And that's the sort of questioning, the line of questioning that you start to get asked by a sports psychologist in order for them to help you is, it, it, it just, it was never going to work, certainly not for someone like me. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I met Trevor, and you know, just the approach was completely different. As athletes, and as people, we all want to be helped. We want, we want, to, be, we, we want to be coached. Give me a skill that's going to help me with what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. Help me develop that skill. No sports psychologist is going to be able to help you develop that skill. A coach will. Yeah. As athletes, we trust coaches. As athletes, we've been, we are where we are as a professional because of coaches because we put our hands, we put our, our lives, our, our livelihood, we put our potential in the hands of a coach who helped us develop it. Yeah. So from a mental skills standpoint, if I wanna be better mentally, I wanna be able to deal with the pressure of competition. I wanna be able to overcome you know, the, 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 the stigma, or I wanna be able to come out of this slump, or I wanna be able to, to, to bounce back immediately from throwing an interception. Somebody's got, I want a skill that helps me do that. Hmm. So somebody can coach you. Who's going to be able to coach me on that? So that's what it is. And I think that's where you get the buy-in uh, from athletes when this is not about there's something wrong with you. Yeah. This is about the idea that your mental capacity or your mental uh, ability to, to, to deal with the pressure and go in there and be the best that you can be is going to impact on the performance. And if it impacts on performance, I want to be the best I can be. Yeah. And so that, and that's where a mental skills coach comes in. And I think as long as it's presented in that way, yeah. then the buy-in is not so difficult. So yeah, and, 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 and I, mean, I remember one of my earlier meetings at Alabama where I just you know, I held a bag of Doritos up in my left hand and an apple in my right hand. And I said, man, do you really need a nutritionist to tell you which is better for you? <laughs> you know, the question is, why should you choose the apple? And, and all of the success comes when we learn how to do simple better. And when you look at all the data that's coming out of Harvard and coming out of all these places, uh, to me, even being raised in this environment, positive thinking has killed this movement. Positive thinking puts uh, its own layer of pressure on people. You know, and, and, and it creates more anxiety often than the, the upside value of it or mindfulness or meditation. Those are great skills and those are advanced, but those aren't what we're teaching. And, and what, we're, what we're finding is all of the data says that, that the negative thinking is the killer. And particularly the externalizing of language, what we say out loud is 10 times more powerful than our thoughts. And what negativity is received at 7x to positivity. So when you looked at all the data early on at Alabama, at Florida State, at Georgia, we said, man, what if we could just get our guys to not say stupid shit out loud? <laughs> and, and, and if we could just get that. And, and if I'm a technological person here, and I understand that, that think of RAM with the computer. A lot of your guys are trying to function with 95 web pages open. 
Michael was clear because he wasn't wasting language. He wasn't wasting thought. He had a clear plan. So what are the things that are in our are completely in our control. So we built something out that we called neutral thinking, which accepted the past. Hey man, that happened, I got food poisoning, not ideal. But the problem is negative, negativity has been replaced by realism. But if negativity is received according to Harvard, right, which should appease this audience, okay, negativity comes at 7x, so if, if, if I go negative, even though I think I'm being realistic, then it immediately leads to catastrophization, which bleeds into the next series of events. And a bad event doesn't mean the next event is gonna be bad. And a good event doesn't mean the next one's gonna be good. So your behaviors determine success. So when Russell threw the interception at the uh, one yard line, you're not pretending like, hey, great, you got the team down 88 yards. That's not what he's thinking at that moment. That was a significant moment. That was challenging. That was difficult. But like Michael told me after his event, there's going to be another race. May not be Olympics, but there's going to be another race. What did we control? Having the best off season. What does a great off season look like? This is what we're going to do. We went down to San Diego. The next year, Russ throws for 35 touchdowns. Um, throws 24 touchdowns, one pick in his final seven games. But what did that? His behaviors and choosing not to externalize negative and get behind behaviors like this guy. Success leaves clues, you know? And, and so I think at Alabama, we study Drake. We study Michael. We study Bolt. We studied why did Jamarcus <coughs> Russell fail? And we've built our, uh, our, our sort of self-efficacy, self-esteem program on case studies. Mark Zuckerberg came in and spent time. We, we learned, uh, we studied Jim Level. How did Jim Level talk when he's 248,000 miles from the earth and uh, the, the limb exploded? Yeah. And why does he sound like Tom Brady sounds. It can't be coincidence. Yeah. The one thing I want to shift to a little bit is still I, I believe in the power of positive affirmation and with you, the gold shoes. Talk about pressure. You just put that on yourself and go out on the, the biggest stage like you said and it'd be kind of silly if you came with silver or bronze. So let's talk a little bit about that, that decision. Yeah, it's a good thing that worked out. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, th th there was an interesting project to begin with because it was never about the color of the shoes. Um, it was a project that I worked on with Nike um, and we started about a year and a half before the Olympic Games and the idea was to make the most technologically advanced, lightest track spike or cleated uh, footwear ever. And so we worked on it, worked on lots of different prototypes and uh, what was interesting was the, the final prototype um, my uh, Toby Hatfield was a lead shoe designer at Nike for, and did all of my, my footwear. He came in and he was super excited about it. He had this great presentation and my coach and I were sitting around a table at the track and he says, he pulls it out and I was like, oh, shit, that is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> That's gonna be so, so cool. But it wasn't the goal shoe. It was a, it was a track spike and it, it, it looked like a, it had a mirror finish on it so you could see your reflection in it had never seen anything like this before. And my coach, and I was like, that is, that's incredible. I want that, that's <laughs> it. And don't do anything to it. And, um, and my coach was just kind of looking just like, nah. and I was like, coach, what? It's like, Cause he said, I don't like it. And I said, what is it that you don't like about it? And he says, it looks cool if you're holding it right here and you can see your reflection. I think with 100,000 people sitting in the stands looking at it, it's just gonna look like a regular silver shoe. <laughs> and as soon as he said silver shoe, before I knew it, I said, Toby, can you make that in gold? <laughs> and, uh, and his jaw just dropped like, are you seriously considering wearing gold shoes? And uh, so I said, yeah, I'm serious. And he says, yeah, we can do that in gold. And that's how it became gold. And it was, I, I never <laughs> ever thought about what we all recognize here now that it would have been disastrous <laughs> had I not won the gold medal. Um, or, or two of them because I had said I'm going to make history and become the first person to win gold medals in both the 200 and 400 meters. Um, but that was, that was my mindset. Yeah. I, I, I was not going there for anything else. I wasn't training for anything else. And so that's why it was so automatic for me uh, because that was my mindset. Yeah, it was amazing and epic. And you created a trend too. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm wearing my gold shoes as well right now, as you see. And I, I want to also kind of touch upon a little bit of a, you know, a personal story you had in the last six months here where you, know, you suffered a stroke. And 
but you recover it in record time, partially. Uh, what you I do. It through. Yeah, it's <laughs> what you do. <laughs> so, um, can you just share a little bit of that story with the, the group? Yeah, it was, you know, happened? I was. Like, you're really fit, so I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and the thing is, is so when, when you have a stroke or any sort of heart disease or heart, heart attack or anything, you know, or in order to prevent that, rather, you know, if you want to prevent that, the first things they tell you is, you know, uh, don't smoke. I've never smoked. Keep your weight down. <laughs> Work out. I was working out when I had the stroke. <laughs> True story. Don't eat junk food. My wife is a health nut and a um, trained chef. So I was doing all of the right things. And um, I was working out at my, I literally was working out when it happened. I was working out at my gym at my home, right here in Malibu. And um, after I finished, I was still in little, I couldn't coordinate my left foot. I was trying to turn around and it's just, it was not working. And I felt this tingling in my left arm and um, it just didn't feel right. And, but there was no sort of, you know, like, oh, you know, moment, right? That makes you go, I need to get to the emergency room. This is something that literally, probably most people would have said, I'll just sleep it off, which would have been the worst thing. Well, That's the worst thing you can do. You've got to get to the hospital immediately. And so fortunately, I just know my body and I, know that I knew that this didn't feel right. Um, my wife happened to pass by the gym and I was telling her, I feel weird and I was explaining. So she came in and I was explaining and she was like, sounds serious. And so we were talking about it. So, so she did what we do. You Google that on your phone, right? <laughs> Tingling left side arm after working out. Google. It is typical to sometimes feel some tingling on your left side after a hard workout. <laughs> I've been working out all my life. That is not typical. <laughs> so don't Google, get in the car, get to the ER ASAP. So uh, got to the uh, UCLA emergency room and um, um, I was still having trouble uh, coordinating my foot and then yes. feeling more numbness on my left side. Um, went into an MRI. The uh, first CT scan didn't show a stroke, uh, but went into the MRI. And um, you know, you're in there about 20 minutes. And by the time I came out, I could not walk. I could not stand Jeez. on my left side. And um, went back, you oiled me into a room and um, doctors came in, a team of them, which is scary. And um, so they said, you suffered a stroke deep in your right side of your brain in the thalamus. And um, so, first question I asked was, well, I can't walk, can't stand, can't put any weight on my left side, limited function with my left arm. Um, so, uh, you know, will I recover? You know, and um, they said, look, you know, that's the right, that's the right question, but there is no answer to that question. Only time will tell. No. So I just got into training and, you know, and got after it and got back into the same mindset that I had during the Olympic Games and when I was training for the Olympics and I was able to get back and make a full recovery and do it in record time. Wow. How long did it take? Oh, thank you. I was, uh, I, was back, I was back walking with a pretty pronounced limp um, after a week and um, um, I was back to what my doctor calls normal people normal in about a month and my normal, <laughs> um, which he basically says no one should be, you know, trying to do what you do. But oh um, I'm about 99% wow. back uh, to being normal uh, now in terms of just being able to, you know, get the sort of power from my left side, wow. and, you know, running and all of that sort of thing that I was doing before. But yeah, it was, you know, it, 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 that was mindset. You know, it was, it was mindset, you know, just, I could have very well gone back into sort of the, you know, woe is me and, you know, I was doing all of the right things. Yeah. Why did this happen to me? It shouldn't have happened to me. Um, during the training, it was doing a lot of, you know, therapy, a lot of physical therapy, a lot of balance and coordination exercises. So you're looking in the mirror a lot and I could have very well, you know, been looking in the mirror and thinking, I used to be, you know, Superman. Now I'm, you know, barely able to put weight on my left side. That, that it, I knew enough about myself that that wouldn't work for me. Yeah. Um, I've got a great team of folks at my company that are all athletes or former athletes and we train athletes. And so those folks were all, all of my employees were, you know, sending the, the, the sort of messages that get me going. Yeah. And that is, 
I know you're going to be back, you know, and I expect nothing less. Um, we've got a race coming up, you and me, in three months. I expect you to be, you know, that sort of thing. And that's what gets me going is that sort of expectation and, and putting, you know, and putting that sort of pressure on myself to get yeah. back to where I was. Um, and I had to sort of tune out the, the messages of, oh, Michael, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You know, oh, so sorry. You know, that, that sympathy doesn't work for me. Yeah. You, you have to know who you are and you have to know what you thrive on in order to be able to overcome those sorts of situations. Absolutely amazing and inspirational. I think that's probably a great way to close things out. So really appreciate you both yes, taking you. the time and sharing your words of wisdom with the group here and no racing Michael after the session's <laughs> over. We'll probably get beat still. So thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.